I'm going to talk to you about the power of beauty, the power of beauty of landscape and nature. Now, I've spent all my life campaigning for beauty, first for national parks, then the wider countryside, and most recently as Director General of the National Trust. And this was my last campaign there. It was a campaign that was necessary, because in this world where growth and development seem to be the only show in town, we needed to stand up for beauty. And that's really what I'm going to urge all of you to do today, to join me in standing up for beauty, to call for a charter for beauty, building on that democratic tradition going back nearly 800 years to the Magna Carta. A charter for beauty, I'll call it the Bella Carta, that makes beauty absolutely essential to all our lives. Now, over 100 years ago, Octavia Hill, one of the founders of the National Trust, said, the need of quiet, the need of air, the need of exercise, the sight of sky and of things growing seem human needs common to all. She was talking about the ragged children of London that she marched out on a Sunday to Epping Forest because they'd never seen green grass and rivers and brooks and flowers. But those needs are just as important to us all today. And that's why we need to look back to the Magna Carta of 1215, sealed by King John. Now, the Magna Carta is known to all of us, isn't it? Because it established judicial principles under which our law and that of many other countries is based. The principles of habeas corpus and the right of innocence until proved guilty. But the Magna Carta was about far more than that. And what it was really about was about the barons curbing the excesses of bad King John, who wanted control over the land of England. And the Magna Carta sets out in detail, you can read it here, it sets out how the importance of maintaining land, the productive capability of land and the responsibilities of landowners. It talks of mill ponds and mills, of granaries, of grain, of farming and of land management. And it also talked about the forests, because King John wanted to hunt the forests. He wanted the forests replanted for his personal enjoyment. But of course, the forests, and in those days, they weren't dense forests, they were open glades, were full of people, full of people performing essential tasks, the charcoal burners, the graziers, the woodsmen and the carpenters, for the benefit of all the people. And the Magna Carta stopped King John from taking control and established those common rights which we can still see in practice today. The rights of access to common land, the right to graze sheep and cattle, and the right to collect turf and timber. And that principles, the principles laid down in that Magna Carta, laid the foundation for many centuries of harmonious relationship between the people of this country and our landscape. And it evolved in ways that brought nature, landscape, and, and practices together. The tradition of farming with its very distinctive field boundaries and uh, the, the, that, the natural features alongside the farmed landscape. The way that settlements almost grew out of the landscape, built of vernacular design in local materials, following the clefts and the folds of the land. Now, this wasn't a romantic rural idyll. This was hard. This was hard work. But as you can see, alongside the production of food, the production of building materials and fuel and all those other products, it also produced beauty. Now, the 19th century made an enormous challenge to that. The pace and scale of industrialization, the sense that money was to be made out of the mining of natural resources rather than the harvesting of natural resources. Farming became industrialized, so did, of course, the whole landscape. And the real battle for beauty began then, because there were people who stood up and said, industry and development are not the only things that matter, and the place where that debate really reached fever pitch was in the Lake District, because the Lake District, a beautiful place romanticized by the poets, became the battleground for beauty. This is Thirlmere, the most beautiful central lake, which Manchester Corporation wanted to drown as a reservoir for the people of Manchester. Now, legitimate demands, of course, but beauty was not 
on the agenda. They lost the battle, the valley was drowned, but the amenity movement was born, led by people like Ruskin, uh, William Morris, Octavia Hill, and the others. And in the first half of the 20th century, governments listened. They designated national parks, the Lake District the foremost among them. It also created a planning system. They created protection for ancient monuments, for um, nature, for, for, for features of land uh, of importance for nature conservation. And secondly, many charities were born, the National Trust uh, to protect buildings and open spaces, the RSPB and the Wildlife Trust, all came from that movement for beauty. And that movement for beauty has never been more important than now, because we didn't just then lose beauty, beauty which had been mentioned in legislation, beauty which had been powerfully talked about. Today's world, we don't see beauty in legislation. We don't see the word beauty being used. In fact, we've gone for the policy wonk words, things like ecosystem services, biodiversity, natural environment. We don't use the word beauty anymore. And we haven't just lost the word beauty, we have lost beauty too. In the second half of the 20th century, we committed some crimes against designated beautiful places. We put the A3 extension through St. Catherine's Hill, uh, near Salisbury, we put the Oakhampton Bypass through the Dartmoor National Park, places we thought were protected. And then we also built many thousands of houses, not respecting at all the vernacular or local materials, and we let our cities decline and large parts become derelict. And we haven't just destroyed beauty, we've sort of cluttered our landscape too. Look at these, more signs than you could possibly read, never mind take any notice of. But it's that suburbanization, the homogenization of the landscape, which is as damaging in its own way. We're ironing out the wrinkles and crinkles that make our landscape so beautiful. And of course, things are getting worse. We know the pressures of the economy. We know we have been in recession for many years now. But we've seen some really big challenges to beauty today. The threat to sell off the forests, thankfully reprieved. The threat to dismantle a planning system, thankfully reprieved, but not reprieved because those pressures are still there. And so we're brewing another crisis too, a crisis in our children, because too many children these days grow up without being outside enough. Do you know the statistics are quite horrifying? One in ten children today plays outside in wild places where it was more than a half a generation ago. We've shrunk the area over which our children roam unsupervised by 90% in one generation. We know that, don't we? We don't let our children out of sight anymore. Today, a child is three times more likely to be admitted to hospital for falling out of bed than falling out of a tree. And children are suffering. Childhood obesity, mental illness in children is rising phenomenally. And yet we know about the restorative power of nature. We know that hospital patients recover faster if they can see a tree from their window, something as simple as that. Doctors prescribing walks in nature rather than conventional medicine. Those words of Octavia Hills should be ringing in our ears over a hundred years later. And so we need that charter, not masses more new rules and regulations, but a charter for beauty, a Bella Carta, to carry in our hearts and help us make good decisions. Decisions that give our children the right to experience nature, to get muddy knees without being told constantly to be careful, to play outside, to camp, to do all the things, pond dipping, that we remember from our children. Rights as adults, too, to enjoy the open spaces, to feel fresh air, to feel and see beautiful views. And not just the wide open spaces, to see nature close up personal as well. Too many of us are deprived of those things. And so perhaps the time has come to build beauty, not just into our own lives, but into the way we think and make policy and make decisions. Because we can do things beautifully if we choose. We can build houses beautifully, not in an ugly way that we've done for so many decades. We can make our cities beautiful again if we choose. Looking forward, we can make our landscapes beautiful, reuniting the objectives of landscape and nature with those of food production as they coexisted for many hundreds of years. And so perhaps the time has come for us to reappraise our priorities. 
in this world of ours where financial pressures remain very much with us, we know that we're not going to get rich quick anymore. We know that that's with us to stay for some time. But we also know that the experiences that bring us greatest joy are often the simple pleasures of life, the things that don't cost a fortune but are worth money beyond words in terms of the value that they bring to us. Time to think again about the importance of beauty in all our lives. Facing a future without beauty would impoverish us in every possible sense of the word. Facing a future with beauty gives us the confidence to go forward to face whatever life may bring us. Thank you very much.